Okay, thank you. Hello, can you hear me okay? Is this okay in the back? Thanks. Um, so, hi everyone, and thank you for being here, and thank you for having me at AlterConf. Um, I'm going to be talking about my experience transitioning from female to male while also transitioning from Qcool dwelling engineer to entrepreneur. Um, but before I get started, I want to acknowledge um, that as a white person, I have a lot of privilege, and that also as someone going through a gender transition, specifically from female to male, I am coming into a lot of privilege in that way as well. Um, so this is me here looking kind of uh, uncertain and nervous, and I thought this was kind of a fitting picture for my AlterConf talk because that's really how I've been feeling over the last 18 months as I've been going through this transition. Um, and as I've been approaching these kind of dual transitions, I've been finding that it's been really hard for me to find support, um, largely because I wasn't able to find narratives in um, the community about transitions that kind of looked like mine did, and because I wasn't able to find stories that I personally could relate to when people wanted to know how they could help me, I didn't know what to say. So my motivation for uh, presenting this is to add you know, a, another perspective for what transitioning can look like for someone like me, and I hope that it may make things easier for other people in the future, and that um, you may learn more about a transgender experience. So, um, this is a quote from one of my favorite books. It's called Gender Failure. It's a collection of gender stories from Ivan Coyote and Ray Spoon, who are two Canadian trans artists. And um, this is a quote from one of Ray Spoon's stories in the book, in which they said, at the same time I was writing songs for my first album, I came out as transgender. It was not a great business plan. Um, <laughs> and as I like to say it, transgender entrepreneuring or transpreneuring, the worst idea ever. So I definitely could identify with this quote from Ray Spoon. And furthermore, the story they were sharing about this was that they had come out as trans identifying as male. And because they have this singing voice that they did not want testosterone to take from them, they were not going through hormone replacement therapy. And therefore, it was very hard for them to read as male. And they talked about the struggles of touring in rural Canada singing country music and having this gender presentation that didn't match who they really were. They later retired from gender altogether, which is something I really, uh, I like that idea a lot. Um, so yeah, I just, I thought that would be a, a nice quote to start off with. Whoop. All right, so here I am um, in May of last year on May Day, I quit my corporate job. I like to say that I've lived in Portland for 12 years now and it finally got to me, like I quit my corporate job. and <laughs> I haven't opened a food cart yet, but stay tuned. Um, so I'm standing there triumphantly holding these two contracts that are signed and people want to work with me and I had no idea what I was getting into. I knew that two contracts definitely did not make a business. Um, and if you're wondering, no, Intel was not one of my contracts, regrettably, it was the place I was quitting. Um, so a few months before this, that was in May, in March of that year, at my birthday party, I'd, I had this name tag on, kind of like the one on my pants. Um, oh, that reminds me, you can take photos and stuff. I don't remember if that was talked about, that's cool. Um, but I had this name tag on and it said, my name is Sev, please call me he, him. And it was the very first time that I reached out and said, you know, I think I might be more comfortable in the world if you refer to me in this way as a male and if I use this name. I wasn't really sure, it was kind of an experiment and so in that way I also had no idea what I was getting myself into. So here we go, it was a good time. So I quit my job and then for the rest of the year I did some things like working on a few of those contracts, I went hiking, talked to a therapist a lot. Um, one of the things that was very difficult for me is that really I had a hard time accepting myself as trans. I spent a lot of time trying to talk myself out of it in therapy and exploring a lot of other options. Like, you know, I don't really have to have top surgery. I would actually look around at cis men and be like, his boobs are bigger than mine. See, I don't have to do this because I really just didn't want to go through this whole process and didn't want to deal with it. Um, so I spent a lot of time talking to a therapist. And other things I did were um, I recuperated from my long stint in the corporate world by partying like a cat in a funny hat, I suppose. And then I got top surgery, like you do. Um, so then, um, at the beginning of 2016, I decided I had to get really serious about this business thing. Um, I had been an engineer my entire career, and I heard that like if you're gonna be an entrepreneur or something, you're supposed to network and talk to people. So I got myself a business mentor, and she's like, you need to go network with people. So I'm like, right, I'm gonna network. Um, so this was kind of two months post-op. 
I started going out and networking. And this is um, a picture of the Camp Near Me project. It was one of the projects that I was looking into as a potential, hopeful, maybe source of future revenue for me. Um, so I'm going to these meetings, doing this unfamiliar thing of networking, and by that time, I'd really started to come to accept myself and my reality as a trans guy. So, but I didn't really read that way. Um, kind of similar to Ray Spoon, I wasn't on hormones at that time. I was still like, I don't really want to do that. So um, I had to go out into public and continue meeting people over and over and introducing myself and a lot of times trying to clarify pronouns. And it was just really uncomfortable. Um, I like to think of it as kind of like you have this, uh, you know, you had a, um, an angel and a devil on your, you know, in the old cartoons on your shoulders. And growing up in the Northeast uh, with rural Protestant parents, I had like shame and guilt on my shoulders. So I felt like since I had accepted this thing that I didn't want to, that maybe because I'd been lying to myself about being trans, I couldn't lie to other people. Um, so a lot of times, you know, may maybe where I would have let people go ahead with the misgendering, I was like, I feel wrong letting that happen. Um, and it was just, it was exhausting. If any one of you has ever experienced this going out, not being read as who you are, and constantly having to correct people, you know, and people like responding in a variety of ways, some people are allies, some people blow up at you and say really nasty things. Um, I had one woman who, when I corrected her pronouns, her use of pronouns for me, she uh, kind of went, oh, well, you know, I, I saw this TV show, and the person in the TV show had a name that was like yours, and, and they were a woman, and, and I was just like, okay, and it was kind of a much of a scene that like the people that we were talking to just kind of walked away, and then she just ended it with, you know, I just call them like I see them. And I was like, wow. And then about 20 minutes after that, um, I sat down with this woman because she was a gatekeeper to a lot of opportunities for me and tried to not cry while she is trying to talk business to me. So it was a crappy time. Um, and so many times as I was going throughout, you know, and networking and trying to business or whatever, um, I would be invited to come to women's groups. So like somebody would say, hey, I have, you know, there's a great women's founders group that I'm part of. You should come to this women's mastermind group or, you know, this women's tech organization. We'd like to hear you come, like, speak about a certain thing or whatnot. And while I wouldn't have really hesitated accepting those invitations before, I now started to feel strange about them because, again, it was like, well, now that I'm accepted that I'm a trans man, I need you to know that I'm not a woman and I'm a trans guy, so thank you for inviting me, but is it okay for me to be there? And a lot of times the answer was, huh, I don't know. And my, you know, I didn't have anything to say because I didn't know either. I'd, I'd never gone through a gender transition before, strangely enough. Um, so. I felt this kind of tension uh, developing in a relationship to a community that had really meant a lot to me throughout my tech career. Um, this is a very old picture. Uh, this is in 1998, I think, at uh, the Women in Engineering Summer Workshop at The Ohio State University, where I was about to start my freshman year as an engineering major. I'm the one on the left. Um, I'm wearing a Rent t-shirt. I was really into Rent. Um, and this experience, like when I was thinking about specifically how my relationship with the women in the tech community is changing, I know that like going through a transition, we lose access to spaces and we lose certain relationships in our lives. And I was trying to understand why this one felt so acute for me. Um, and in these groups where I was able to gather with women in engineering, I found like it was like I was able to find a place for myself in the tech community. Um, I don't have um, common experience with cis guys. They don't feel like my people to me. Um, so I've always kind of enjoyed being part of the women in tech space and the queer um, in tech spaces that I've been able to be a part of. So losing this connection or not knowing how to go about it was, um, was really upsetting for me. And it wasn't just like the camaraderie and the, you know, developing these friendships this women in tech community was how I had been able to be successful, how I was able to have a career. So after going through this workshop, I was able to attend graduate school because I had a scholarship because I was a woman in tech. That directly led to my job at Intel, where I was able to navigate the corporate labyrinth hell that is what a company of that size is like because the women at Intel network is super strong there 
and I knew if I was having a problem with a manager or I didn't know how to move forward in my career or I was feeling bad because all of the guys went out to lunch and didn't ask me to go with them, that I had people that I could go and talk to. Um, and so I was just really uncertain about how was I gonna make my way in the world. And so I would try to talk to people about these feelings as I was struggling through this, and I found that it was hard um, for people to understand where I was coming from. They would say things sometimes like, well, things are gonna be better for you. You're transitioning to male, so you're gonna have privilege, it's gonna be fine. And I just didn't feel like my message was getting across because I knew based on what I had been looking into as a trans guy and my n not wanting to take hormones at that point, that I was afraid that I would never read as male and that I'd be stuck in this kind of no man's land. So, let's see. Oh, this is Aiden Dowling. So, um, you may have seen Aiden Dowling's beautiful chest. He was one of the finalists to be on the cover of Men's Health magazine, and if he had, he would have been the first trans man to do so. Um, this is often what representation of trans guys and trans people in general in the media is, this very cisgendered presentation of you know, who we are expected to be. Um, and, well, let me go and bring this quote up. I recently read this article in the Mary Sue where a trans guy was interviewed about how he felt about the coverage around Aiden Dowling. And he says, you know, I don't really mind these pictures of him being shirtless, even if for me they're very triggering because I'll never look like that. In fact, most trans men will never be read correctly being able to read as cis for both trans men and women is a huge privilege that most will never enjoy. And that's something that I knew and was desperately afraid that I was going to spend the rest of my life being misgendered and not having any kind of community as a result. Um, I knew that there was no guarantee that I would ever be read as male um, and so I really just didn't know what my future might hold. So here I was grappling with losing access to this community and not knowing if there would be something to come in and replace it. Um, it really had been the source of my ability to make a living in a career that I loved. And at the same time, I'm trying to fight against this sort of stereotype about trans people to have my personal struggles heard. And I'm doing all this while I'm trying to start a business, which like I said, is this is pretty much the worst idea ever. Don't do it. Um, so. But at this point, as you can probably tell, my voice is low, I have some chest hair, or not chest hair, thank God, I have facial hair. Oh, I hope I don't get chest hair. I really, oh, I can't. My partner said they would shave my back if it comes to that, but I'm really, anyway. Um, <laughs> TMI, sorry. So I have been on HRT um, now, and so I am not getting misgendered as often, I, especially if I'm talking to people on the phone they gender me as male most of the time. Um, so I hope that despite the fact that for me, I finally, for my own reasons, did end up going on hormones, that you don't think that the story that I've just told you doesn't hold any water because I am still extremely privileged among trans people to be able to access these kinds of um, therapies and to have both the financial wherewithal and the health to go through transition and the fortunate genetics that at you know, the late age of 36, that it's having some kind of an impact. Um, I just, you know, I, I really wanted to continue to tell this story because I feel like it's important and it's not, my experience today and going forward is not really representative of trans people. Um, and to kind of speak to uh, what I was talking about in not being able to find representation of stories like myself and being very unsure about community going forward, in the tech industry, um, I wanted to show this uh, study that was performed by TransHack, who, that's an organization that's out of Oakland that um, serves trans people. And um, they did a survey of trans and gender nonconforming identities in tech. Um, and so based on the survey respondents, I think there were 600 people, of all of these folks, about 6% identified themselves as trans men, um, which is pretty few. And in my own experience, I haven't met a lot of trans guys in tech. Um, so as I've been kind of struggling with what type of space I can be part of in the tech industry, I've been really encouraged to see women in tech movements do the right thing as it relates to trans people um, and starting to be very upfront about, yes, trans women belong here. They are women. Good. They do. 
and in some cases, also widening their charters to bring in non-binary and genderqueer folks um, into these communities of support. And I definitely understand um, why there is a need for a separate space for people like that from folks like me who are male identified. Um, but I will also say that I feel like I need intentional community space as well. And that's something that I'm not sure if I, how to find that or you know, where, that, where, I might, um, where I might go to find those sorts of things. Because as I said, like that's, I still feel like that's my community um, and I don't see another option bet between not being part of those groups and then just kind of being in the ether as a male in the tech industry. And so, let's see. Oh, it's my last slide, nine of nine. So um, there were some things I had hoped that you took away from this talk, and that's um, that, number one, the trans folks have distinct experiences. So like I said, a lot of the struggle that I had moving through this transition was that stories like mine weren't part of popular media, they weren't cis-normative, and so people didn't really know about them. Um, so I'm hoping that I can add to maybe some non-cis-normative stories of transition. Um, and the other thing that I would ask is that you please consider supporting organizations that are open to all trans people that provide all of us support. Um, in particular, TransHack, the organization that ran um, that study, they are um, struggling to survive. They are having a very hard time finding funding and they're doing really important work. And as far as I know, one of the only places where someone like me would be able to go and be part of an intentional community space. Um, and I would also you know, ask you to consider being part of and creating intentional spaces that are welcoming for all trans people. It's something that's been on my mind as I've been going through this and I'm like, oh, it would be really nice if I could find something like this in Portland. My therapist is like, you should organize something. And I said, I don't like organizing things. And she said, um, no one who organizes things likes doing it. <laughs> to which I responded with uncomfortable silence. So if you are in Portland or you'd be otherwise try interested in trying to help me create space, because um, I would like to bring in other partners and not do it by myself, um, please talk to me. And um, what was this? Oh, and uh, Thursday, Bram, if you follow her on Twitter, she tweeted out this really cool article last week about the design of women's space. And they go through a variety of different types of women's space. And kind of like the last one is... Um, talks about space that's not women's space, it's just kind of non-gendered space, and that's sort of like the, the space where trans men would be welcome. And I thought this was um, a really good breakdown of like what space looks like and how to label your spaces appropriately so that you can be sure of the audiences that you're um, communicating with. And that's all, so thank you.